Hello, this is Ms. Jetha coming at you from Seattle, Washington. I hope you are enjoying learning about natural selection, and I'm excited to dive into Chapter 2, Lesson 2.1 with you today. Let's get started. Here's what you'll need for this lesson. A pencil or pen, some line or blank paper, and here are some optional but encouraged things you can add on a family member, a friend, or even a pet that you can check in with. A computer logged in to Amplify. Let's warm up. Pause the video and read Sherman's story about bird beaks. Turn and talk to a friend or a family member or jot your responses down on a piece of paper about the following questions after you read Sherman's story. In this environment, which trait is adaptive for the birds? Sherman suggests that reproduction always creates individuals with adaptive traits. Does this seem correct? Why or why not? The trait that is adaptive for these birds, that is the one that helps them survive, is their strong and tough beaks. That's because their strong and tough beaks allow them to eat the food that is available in their environment. Now, in terms of reproduction always creating individuals with adaptive traits, I'm not quite sure if the birds with weak beaks all had offspring with strong beaks so that they would survive. I feel like we need more evidence to see if Sherman is correct. This brings us to our chapter two question which is, how do individuals in a population get their trait? Let's take a look at some new evidence considering this question. How did the trait for increased poison level become more common in the new population? Pause the video and turn and talk to a friend or family member or jot down your responses on a piece of paper about the following question. What differences do you notice between these two histograms on the right-hand side? What I notice is that in this population 50 years ago, there was a large number of newts that included low poison level, and the environment that they were in did not include snakes. However, in this population today, I notice that there's a large number of newts that have a high poison level and their environment does include snakes. What we're going to do now is use the simulation to investigate a claim. That claim is reproduction always creates individuals with adaptive traits. We're gonna see if that claim is supported or refuted. Now, in the natural selection simulation on Amplify, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go into my hamburger menu and go into reproduction claims. This will allow us to gather evidence about the claim we are investigating. I wanna load that reproduction claims mode. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose an Osterlope to follow and will follow that Osterlope until it mates and be able to see the offspring that results in the process of reproduction. I'm gonna choose um, an Osterlope with non-adaptive traits first. I'm gonna click on my Osterlope and I'm going to follow that Osterlope and then select pause to pause the simulation after running it. Okay, so I see that the Osterlope is about to reproduce and I can see here, we have one Osterlope that has a color of three mating with an Osterlope also with a color of three. Let's see what their offspring looks like. Their offspring also has a color of three. I'm gonna write that down on my data table sheet. 
All right, so what we saw is that we had one parent with a color trait level of three, another parent with a color trait level of three, and then the offspring color was also a color trait level of three. Let's do another trial and see what happens. Now let's see what happens when these two australopes mate. This australope has a color level of four. This australope has a color level of one. The australope that they have produced as offspring is a color level of one. Let's record that on our data table. Remember, these are australopes with non-adaptive traits. Our first pair was an australope with level three, an australope with level three, and they had offspring with a level three as well. The second pair, one australope was a level four, one was a level one, and then their offspring was a level one also. Now let's see what happens when an australope with an adaptive trait reproduces. Notice how the carnathon just passed by the australope. And another carnathon as well. Our australope is now looking for a mate and he's found a mate with a color level of seven. We can see here that both australopes have a color level of seven. Let's see what their offspring looks like. What do you think it might be? So their offspring ostelope also had a color level of seven. Let's do another trial with another ostelope that has an adaptive trait for this environment. We're gonna follow this ostelope right here who has a color level of seven. They're looking for a mate. The mate that they have chosen has a color level of five. And let's see what their offspring might look like. What do you think? Their offspring has a color level of seven. Let's document this on our data sheet. So let's go ahead and record what we just saw in the sim on our data table. For trial one, we had one parent with a color trait level of seven. We had the other parent of that pair with a color trait level of seven, and their offspring had a color trait level of seven. In our second pair for trial two, we had one parent with a color trait level of seven, one with a trait color level of five, and their offspring had a trait color level of seven. So what does this all mean? If we compare our two data tables showing the australopes with non-adaptive traits and the australopes with adaptive traits, what we can see here is given the environment which had carnathons and a color level of seven, in both cases, non-adaptive australopes reproduced with australopes that had non-adaptive traits and adaptive australopes reproduced with australopes that did have adaptive traits. Let's look at the distribution of this color trait on a population level. So here, as we can see in generation one, that we had a large number of australopes that had a blue color trait level. And that would be a color trait level of like one to five, essentially. However, in that same population at generation 10, what we can see here is that there are less australopes with blue and green color trait levels. And our trait distribution is now leaning towards yellow. So the colors, it's seven, eight, nine, seven, eight, and nine. 
Now, using all this data, all this evidence that we just found in the sim by looking at our Australopithecus populations and their colors, let's think about that claim again. Reproduction always creates individuals with adaptive traits. Pause the video, turn and talk to a family member, or jot your response down on a piece of paper. Was our claim supported or refuted by the evidence that we just gathered in the simulation? How do you know? So let's discuss this claim together. The claim, of course, was reproduction always creates individuals with adaptive traits. We can see now with the evidence and the, thus the data that we gathered in the sim, this claim is in fact refuted because non-adaptive traits were passed on just like the adaptive traits were passed on. There is no difference there. Ha additionally, in a population, the traits of the offspring are generally similar to those of their parents. So if there were blue Australopes in the environment, then they would be passing on those traits to their offspring, generally speaking. And if there were more yellow Australopes in the population, then those Australopes would pass on their traits of color to their offspring, generally speaking. In a population, the traits of offspring are generally similar to the traits of their parents, whether those traits are adaptive or non-adaptive. Reproduction plays a key role in how the distribution of traits in a population changes over time, but this involves, of course, having the opportunity to reproduce in the first place. So let's take a look at how trait distribution changes over generations with a predator and without a predator. Here we have our trait distribution diagrams over generations. This is the, the diagram we just looked at, and this is our population with carnathons. In our Australope color distribution, what we can see here in generation one with carnathons, we had more Australopes with a level one through five color levels that would be blue to green. In generation 10, though, our distribution shifted and changed so that more of our Australopes were at a color level of seven to nine. Now we can see here, there are still some of the lower color trait levels existing, but just not as prominent as those in the seven to nine color trait levels. Now, without carnathons, let's take a look. In generation one, just like we saw before, we have more Australopes in color levels from one to six and um, less in seven to 10. However, in generation 10 over here, what we can see here is that we don't get that same shift that we saw in the population with carnathons. So we can see here that our color trait level maintains at a level of prominence from one to five um, compared to seven through 10 versus that shift that we saw in the environment that had carnathons. So the next question we have to tackle is understanding how this genetic shift is actually possible. In other words, what is going on at the molecular scale in these organism cells that are allowing for this shift to take place? One important vocabulary word that we need to understand for this is gene. Genes are instructions for making a protein molecule. Here's a diagram that shows genes. Genes are located on chromosomes. There are one, two, three sets of chromosomes in our diagram. And what chromosomes are, are tightly wound bundles of DNA, kind of like a bundle of yarn all balled up. There are two copies of each gene, one on each chromosome of the pair. And when an organism reproduces sexually, it gives the offspring one of each of its chromosomes and therefore one copy of each gene. Another way of saying that is that parent, parents pass on 
one copy of each gene to their offspring. Another vocabulary word we need to be aware of is protein molecule. A protein molecule is a type of large molecule that performs important functions inside of organisms. In science, of course, when we can't actually have our hands on something that's so microscopic, like chromosomes or like protein molecules, we love to create models, as you might be aware of. So in our diagram here, these are two different models of protein molecules. This first one is called a ribbon diagram, and the second one is called a space filling model. Both show the structure of a protein. These words will help us as we read a little bit more about what is going on in terms of genetics in organisms. The article we are going to read today that will help us with this understanding is called Glowing Jellies. Imagine splashing in a calm ocean cove at night. As you splash, you notice green flashes in the water, glowing jellies. These are called crystal jellies. They can't sting humans, so you can swim and watch them glow green as you bump into them. Where does this trait for being able to glow come from? In 1992, some scientists decided to find out. They examined the cells of crystal jellies and discovered the glow comes from a protein. They, have, they gave the protein the name green fluorescent protein, or GFP for short. To find out how these jellies make GFP, scientists investigated the jelly's genes. So I'm seeing here that this glowing property comes from a protein. So this makes me think about how proteins allow for traits, traits like glowing to be expressed. Let's move on. A gene is instructions for an organism's cells to make a particular protein. Scientists were able to find the gene that gave the jelly cells instructions to make the GFP protein. If a jelly has the GFP gene, its cells can make green fluorescent protein. If its cells make green fluorescent protein, the jelly can glow. The gene leads to the protein, which leads to the trait. That is a really important point. I'm going to make sure that I underline that. The gene leads to the protein, which leads to the trait. I also think I might want to create a flow chart to be able to demonstrate um, the connection between these three items. So we have genes. that provide instructions for proteins. That are then able to be expressed as traits. Let's move forward with our reading now. How does a jelly get the gene for glowing? When a pair of adult jellies reproduce, each one passes down genes to the offspring. Genes are found in chromosomes, and chromosomes come in pairs. An organism has two copies of any given gene because there is one copy on each chromosome in a pair. However, the two copies of any particular gene can be the same version or different versions. 
These different versions of a gene are called alleles. When jellies reproduce sexually, each parent passes down one of each of their chromosomes with their genes on it to the offspring. That's an important point, and we'll pop back over in a second to our diagram to demonstrate this as well. So each parent passes down one of each of their chromosomes with their genes on it to the offspring. Now, humans have 46 chromosomes, which means that 23 of our chromosomes come from our biological mother and 23 of our chromosomes come from our biological father. If at least one of the adult jellies has the version of the gene that is instructions for GFP, then the gene could be passed down to the offspring. Offspring with the gene will have cells that produce GFP, so they will glow also. Moving back to our diagram from our definition of gene, as well as on this page, we can see here there are different versions that the genes can be. These are different versions. We can see that from the different colors that are presented in these diagrams. Those different gene versions are called alleles. And we can also see, like we demonstrated before, that each set of chromosomes, in each set of chromosomes, one of those chromosomes comes from the biological mother and one comes from the biological father. Therefore, each chromosome carries one of those genes. So one of the genes in this case comes from the biological mother and one comes from the biological father. Let's move forward with some reflection questions as well. So let's reflect on what we've learned today. First, where do genes that determine an individual's traits come from? A, an individual can be born with any genes since genes are random. B, individuals grow genes specific to their environment. Or C, parents pass their genes down to their offspring. Or D, parents choose which genes their offspring have when each individual is born. Pause the video and respond to this question with A, B, C, or D based on what we learned in this lesson. That's right, it's C. Parents pass their genes down to their offspring. Here's another question for you. How do genes determine an individual's traits? A, genes directly lead to traits. B, genes are random and don't lead to traits. C, genes give organisms the ability to change their traits. Or D, genes are instructions for making protein molecules and protein molecules determine traits. Turn and talk to someone near you and respond to this question with A, B, C, or D. That's right, it's D. Genes are instructions for making protein molecules, and protein molecules determine traits. Let's do one more question to reflect on our learning for today. How can an individual be born with an adaptive trait? A, the individual can choose to change the adaptive trait when they want to. B, the parents had genes for the adaptive trait, which they passed down to the individual. C, the individual can choose to have an adaptive trait at birth. Or D, the parents can choose for the offspring to have genes for the adaptive trait. Write your response down or turn to someone near you and respond to this question with A, B, C, or D based on our lesson today. That's right, it's B. 
Parents have genes for the adaptive trait, which they pass down to the individual. Great job today, and I will see you for Chapter 2, Lesson 2 next.